And today I am fulfilling a special request from Margaret and she has asked me to demonstrate an intuitive painting process. So my intuitive drawings that I do every morning and share on Instagram are a little bit different. Um, I start with a Hobonichi and I put a watercolor wash down, let it dry and then the next morning um, I, I use a pencil to pull out what I see. And an intuitive painting process is a little bit different. And I, I shared some of my intuitive paintings um, in a video that I posted yesterday called Be Like Water. So you can take a look at that um, to kind of give you an idea of, of where that comes from and some examples of intuitive paintings that I've done. And I find that <clears throat> this is a really wonderful practice for me to just let go and be dreamy and intuitive with my work. And what I love the most about it is that you can't go wrong. <laughs> it's just you, you, you put paint on paper in a random way and then you just see what you see in the paint and you surround it. So I'm gonna show you those techniques that I use so that you can try it too. I think it's a really wonderful thing for us to do. Um, no matter what our regular art practice is like, this is a wonderful addition to it. So I've got here a large block of Fabriano Artistico cold press paper. You can use any kind of watercolor paper, but because we're getting the paper somewhat wet, we want to make sure it's either in a block form or it's taped down to a drawing board. Otherwise, our paper will, will curl up at the edges and it makes it really hard to work. It'll all just pool in the middle. And I'm going to do two, two because sometimes when we do these, we might not see anything right away, and so you know, if I really want to do a demonstration, I'll, I'll usually put two watercolor washes down, so that I'm guaranteed to find something wonderful. Um, and you know, it, I would say nine times out of twenty, I'm, I'm sorry, nineteen times out of twenty, so more than nine out of ten, um, I do see something in the paint. But every now and then, you get one. That you just don't see anything and that's fine you and and what I usually do is I either tear those um, pieces up to make note cards or gift tags or I put another layer of paint on and then see what happens so there's never waste um, but anyways I'm using um, a squirrel mop in a size 3 this is a da Vinci brush petit gris and um, it's I like it because it holds a lot of water and I can really um, get lots of paint on the paper quickly. So I'm going to do one at a time and you can see I'm just I'm wetting the paper but I'm not going all the way out to the edge of the paper. I'm keeping it central and the reason I do this is because again it helps with the paper curling. It doesn't allow the paper to curl too much but I'm just putting a nice big juicy wash of water on the paper and sometimes I'll dry my brush off a little bit and then I'll kind of whisk my brush back and forth to mop up anything extra. Because I don't want puddles. I just want this nice watery surface for the paint to move on. And then I'm going to go into my, my paints here and just select a color. And I think for this one, I'm going to start with the Wood Violet from Wild Thorn. It's just such a beautiful color. And what I love about um, wood violet is how it just moves on the paper so beautifully. So the Fabriano cold press is not my favorite paper to work on. Um, it's, a, it's a fine paper, it's a beautiful paper, but it's not my favorite. Um, the Fabriano hot press, however, is lovely. But I'm going to use this cold press paper today. I just dropped in some indigo. And you can see I'm not thinking too much about where I'm putting this. I'm going to add a little more wood violet. And I think I'm going to shake it up a little bit and add some raw sienna. 
I tend to put my color down in big blocks and I tend to only use two, three, or four colors. I find less is more with this practice. And once the paint is down, as long as it's still wet, you can continue to add paint. Just dropping it in. And then once it's down, I look to see if I have paint pooling anywhere. And if I do, I dry my brush off and I stick the tip of my brush into the paint to kind of wick up some of the extra. And I just keep drying it off and then sticking my paint in, my, my brush in the paint to wick it up. The reason I do this is because I don't want my paper to pool. I don't want the colors to all pool together. Number one, it takes forever to dry. So there, I just kind of, I'm just kind of wicking up some of the extra. And then it's sort of contradictory, but once I do that, I might take the tip of a wet brush and drop some water in here and there. Just to let those pigments really mingle with one another. And I might have to wick up more water when I'm done with this. Do you see how I'm just sort of randomly dropping water? I love doing this. This part of the exercise is just pure playtime. So once I'm happy with that, and you can take as long as you want, as long as the paper is still wet, you can continue to add. I might give it a little space Spritz of water here and there. I might take my paper and tilt it and let the paints kind of run. And if it runs off the page, it's fine. But you see how that pigment is moving so beautifully. And the colors sort of mix together. Because my surface is still wet, I have this time. If it starts to run off the paper, just have a tissue nearby and you can sort of wipe that up as it runs. It's a big block of paper and I can sort of just wipe my edges if I need to. You don't have to. And then maybe I will splash some more paint in a little more wood violet and just take my brush and just sort of splash it because my paint is still wet. My paper is still wet. Maybe some more of that raw sienna. Spritz it with water a little bit. Pick it up and let it move. I just love this part because I love seeing how the paints react to one another and what they do on the paper. And then once, once I'm happy with it, sometimes I'll take a little bit of salt and just sprinkle some salt on it. Just any kind of salt will do. And the funny thing is, is try different kinds because they all react a little bit differently. So now this one is done and I'm gonna let it dry. So I'm gonna turn my paper around and I'm gonna do another one over here on this side to give myself two choices. And you can do these any size. You could do them really big, really small. It does not matter. So now I'm gonna use some of the Grenat. This beautiful red. 
from Kim's Field Sunset palette. And then I think I'll put some of the Orange Sanguine. And then I think I'm going to go with the Charcoal Black. You can see I'm just playing. I'm just playing with the paint on the paper. You can see I have quite a bit of pooling. So now I'm going to dry my brush off, my paper towel, and just use the tip of my brush to sort of wick up where the paint might pool. I'm going to tilt it a little bit. And that might affect the other side. Normally, you wouldn't do two on one piece of paper, but for demonstration purposes, I wanted to do that. Drop some water in. I think I'm going to add just a splash of mimosa here and there. Bring some sunlight. <laughs> and I'm just playing. watching what happens when I add different elements to what's here. Wicking up extra water. Okay. And I think I'll add a little salt to this one. And it's funny, you know, the salt, sometimes it has a great effect and sometimes not so much. So it just depends on the pigments that you're using, the paper, all of those things matter, how wet the paper is. All right, so I'm gonna turn the camera off and give this plenty of time to dry. It has to be um, totally dry before we move on. So if you want to do this much, then, um, then we can meet back in a little while and continue on. I'm just still wicking up a little bit of water that I see. We really don't want the pooling, even on this one. I see a little bit here and there. Okay, I will be back. Okay, so these are now dry. 
and I did not, what, what, all I did is I cut the piece of paper in half. Um, and what I want to show you is that when the salt dries, you're going to have salt that you have to remove. So depending on how coarse or fine your salt is, I just rub my finger around and I use a hake brush and I just brush the paper off. So just to remove the salt. If some doesn't come off, that's absolutely fine. It's not going to hurt anything. But I get off what I can. Sometimes it leaves a beautiful sheen too. So that's one, and then here's the other one. And these are ready. So the first thing I do um, before I begin to, to paint is I take a look at the painting. And I don't just look at it this way, but I turn it around. And so I'm going to point out to you what I see, and you might see something totally different, which is totally cool. <laughs> but I um, normally I would not suggest to my students what to see in the painting. They do that themselves. But because this is for demonstration, I'm going to show you what I see. And in this direction, the first thing I see is a bird. I see a beak here and an eye and the wings here, the belly, and then the tail coming down and maybe the suggestion of a branch. So I see that. And if I turn it this way, I see a turtle with legs and a tail coming out in his head here. If I turn it this way, I see a face in here. Um, this way I sort of see a fish with spots, with an eye and his dorsal fin, and then coming down here, like a goldfish I see. So I see all different things, which is great. I mean, I could choose any of those, but I'm really kind of liking the bird. <laughs> it's fun. Um, and then in this one, let's see here. Well, right away, I see a woman's, like a, a the faint suggestion of a head with an arm coming up and an arm here and kind of a dress flowing down. So maybe a little girl coming down a hill um, with her dress flowing up, I see. Oh, here I see a bird for sure. Like here's the bird's eye and beak, this head and the belly and then wings coming out either way and then a tail would come down here. And sometimes also I will put the painting far away from me and look at it from a distance. I, I could definitely see a flower in here, a porcupine, I see a raccoon face. So there's many, 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 many things that I see. But I think I really like the bird, so I think I'm going to go with that for this one, this way here. And you can go about this many different ways. Um, and sometimes when people are beginning, I have them sort of take a, a light pencil and put light pencil marks around the shape that they see, and that helps them isolate it. And so I'm going to do that for you, and I'm going to do it very lightly. So I'm just taking the tip of my pencil and just sort of surrounding what I see, the parts of the bird. So I'm not, I'm not adding anything really. I'm, I'm truly just surrounding. Here I see the branch coming down and then the branch kind of comes up that's sort of where I put my brush when I was wicking up the water and then I see the belly coming down and then the tail coming down from that and the wing feathers and then the shoulder of the bird and the wing feathers coming down. And then up here, I see the top of the head. And then it comes down this way. And then I see this big beak. And again, this is not any specific bird. This is just the bird that's, that's appearing. 
And so I'll give them a beak here. And then I see the eye right about here. So I'm just gonna draw a circle where I see the eye. And I think that's all I'll do. So as you can see, I'm not really making anything up. I'm just surrounding what I see, okay? So I'm gonna get my paints back out. And the cool thing is, is the birds really the granat and the orange sanguine and then the charcoal black is around the sides. And so I'm gonna get my smaller brush, which is a squirrel mop that, let's see, where is she? Here she is. And I'm gonna use um, the lid of my palette to mix. And I've got some other paint in there, so I'm just gonna take a tissue and wipe it off. So I've got a clean slate. I often do that. I often use the lid of my paints as a palette. And if you don't have something like that, you can just simply use, um, you can just simply use a plate. A white dinner plate is fine. So the first thing I want to do is I want to isolate this bird. Mmm, coffee. <laughs> And so the main color out here is the charcoal black. So I'm gonna get a bunch of that on my brush. I'm gonna take off my Fitbit because it's metal and anytime I use <laughs> my tin, it sticks to it. Okay. And so I'm putting a little reservoir of the charcoal black in my tin lid or on my palette. And I'm going to add plenty of water to it because I don't want it to be too dark. And I'm going to start anywhere. It doesn't matter where you start. And I'm going to, I'm going to surround this bird shape that I've drawn with the charcoal black paint. And so let's say I'll start here and I'm just, I'm just moving along the pencil line and I put a little paint down and then I'm going to rinse my brush and with clear water I'm just gonna soften that edge, okay? So then I'm gonna continue down and go this way. And then use clear water to sort of soften it out. And then I continue with clear water, bringing the paint all the way so it sort of disappears into what was there before. So look what I have here. I made a line with the paint and then I used clear water to pull that paint down and sort of disperse it. Okay, so I'm gonna continue on. I see the tail here, where I put the tail, and I'm just following my pencil lines. And it may seem dark at first, but then when I take the clear water, and I start to pull it out, it dissipates. And you, because it's so transparent, you still see what's underneath that. So I still see that lovely mark where the salt worked. And I just keep turning my paper, grabbing my paint, going along that pencil line, And I can stop anywhere that it feels right. I don't have to do it all at once. Just keep getting clear water and I pull it all the way to the edge. So the color you choose is whatever color you see most of in the area that you're taking that paint. And I see mostly charcoal black. And pulling it out to the edge and it's so cool because I can even drop in a little more charcoal black if I want it doesn't matter because it's very dreamy and loose I'll continue and all I'm doing is I'm isolating the shape that I saw it's already there And just like anything else we do, this takes practice. So the first one you do, you're gonna be learning. 
And the second one you do, you're going to be practicing what you've learned. And the third time you do it, I bet you're going to be really pleased. You might be pleased on the first try. Many, many students are. And you should be, no matter how it turns out. So you see I'm just taking clear water and I'm softening that paint out to the edge and bringing that nice transparent wash. And I can still see everything that was underneath it because it's so watery and transparent. Okay, so now it usually only takes one layer to surround your subject like I've done here. And now you can clearly see the shape that I saw kind of popping up off of the page. So we have this background and then we have this center image. So before I continue, I want to let this dry, all right? Because then we're gonna come back in and we're gonna add a little bit more paint um, to, our, to our bird. And we're going to put some features in, maybe with a white gel pen or a black marker or something like that. So I'm going to let this dry again, and then I will be back to continue. Okay, so my back layer is dry, my background layer. We're dry enough. It's, yeah, it's dry enough. And so now I want to focus on my bird. And so whatever it is that you're doing, all you really want to do is enhance the shapes that are there, okay? And so I think I'm gonna start with the branch, and then I'm gonna move up to the eye and the beak. So for the branch, um, we've got all different colors here, but I think the color I'm going to use, um, you really wanna stick with the same colors that you used in your background. So I'm going to take some more of that charcoal black and I'm going to put a water glaze down on my branch. And I'm just going to stay within the lines that I have here. And I'll work a small section at a time. And I'm going to take the charcoal black pretty dark and just run it along the bottom. of my branch to give it some definition and just sort of let the paint flow up a little bit. And then I think I'll take a little bit of the orange sanguine, just a tiny bit for the top section and just drop it in. Just a little tiny bit and then I'll keep moving and I had I had the branch kind of going across him in front of his body so I'm going to continue that across I drew it that way because I saw it that way and see I'm just doing a little section at a time that's fine and then move across and finish it off. So you see, I'm not doing anything detailed. I'm just truly enhancing what I have. I'm giving it presence and shape. Okay, 
if I miss some spots, I can go back and just sort of fill in. All right, so I think that's good for the branch. And now I'm gonna work on his, because this is wet, I don't necessarily wanna go into the wing and the body right now, because then it'll run into my branch and I want my branch to be separate. So I am going to move up. I could actually, you know what, I'll do the tail. And the tail is mostly, I see mostly the orange, sanguine. So I'm going to put my water glaze down. And the reason I'm putting a water glaze down is because I want this to be very transparent. And I want the paint to sort of just flow. So I'll take some of my orange sanguine and just drop it in and then use a wet brush to sort of push it around that water glaze and just let it be really light and dreamy. And it can just disappear here at the bottom. All right, so now the tail's done. And because the tail, I, I think I'm gonna add a little bit more, just right up here underneath, to make it a little bit darker where the tail meets the body. Because usually when something is underneath something else, it's gonna be a little bit darker where they overlap. And so this wing is over the body, I mean over the tail, and so I'm just dropping in a little extra paint there. All these things come from painting and from experience and from looking at things closely. So now I'm gonna move up here to his beak. And all I'm gonna do, I think all I'm gonna do, his beak is mostly granite. And so I'm gonna just take a little bit of the granite. And the lower beak of a bird is often darker than the upper beak. So I'm gonna paint a little strip of the granite. And then I'm going to just let it disappear toward the edge. And I can drop in a little bit more where the upper and lower beak meet. And then I'll do the same at the top. where his beak kind of goes into his head and just put a line of granite there. And just sort of, sort of let it disappear to the lower beak. And then I can add again, just drop in a little bit more at the top. So I'm not, I'm not doing too much, but I'm just enhancing what's there. So for his eye, it's pretty dark, you know, I see it, but it's pretty dark. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a black fine liner pen, and I'm just gonna sort of stipple around his eye where I have that pencil line. And then I'm gonna draw the dark pupil and just sort of fill it in. But I'm gonna leave a little bit of space where the catch light might be. And birds usually have catch lights in their eyes because their eyes are so round and glossy. There. And I might even just put a few stipple marks down the center of his beak. And even where his beak kind of comes in. Okay. And then for the catch light, I think I'll just take white gel pen and just put a little touch of white on his eye. And that's all I'm going to do for his eye. So, this is all still wet, and I don't want to add any more to paint to this right now because they'll all run together. So once again, I'm going to let this dry, 
and then I'll come back and put the, the wing color on and the body color on and we will have a finished bird. All right, so you can catch up with yours if you're doing it along with me um, or take a break. Or actually, you don't have to take a break. The video will just continue <laughs> sometimes. Um, anyway, so I'm going to let this dry and I will be back. Okay, so he is all dry now. And now I'm going to continue on. And what I see here is I love that this wing is orange. And I, I mostly love it because the wings are sort of rounded at the top of the shoulder. And usually they would catch the sunlight um, if there's sunlight. So I'm going to paint a layer of the orange sanguine on his wing just to sort of separate it from the rest of him. And once again, I'm going to use a water glaze. So I keep things nice and fluid and light. And I'll just go up to the branch and stop there. And then I'll take some of the orange sanguine and I'm going to put it on my palette so it's nice and fluid, add a little water to it. And just drop it in. let it just sort of mix and mingle with the water okay you can drop in a little more water just let it be there and then I'll just continue on down here put some water glaze down just drop in orange sanguine. Okay, so that's done. Now I'm going to go up to his head and I think I'll use a mixture of the colors. So when I put my water glaze down, I don't want to run into the wing, so I'm going to leave just a tiny little bit of separation between the two. Go around the eye, up to the beak. And just sort of stop at the bottom of his head. And I'll drop in some orange where I see it. See how it stops? Where I put that line. Grab some of the granat, put it on my palette and add some water to it and then just drop it in and it's going to stop where the water stops and then I can take the tip of my brush and just sort of move around the edges and clean them up a little bit if I want to Just sort of feather that granat into the orange sanguine a little bit. There. Now for his body, I'm going to do the same thing. But I've got, I've got the mimosa in here, and I really want to play that up on his breast. So I'm going to start with a water glaze again. And I'm going to leave a little bit of separation between the two between the head and the body and the wing and the body. Just a tiny little area where there's no paint. Just get that water glaze down. And I'm going to use mimosa first at the top of his breast because it's already there. And I'm just going to drop it in and let it do what it wants to do. And then drop in some orange where I see orange. And then drop in a little granat where I see the granat. So I'm, I'm really just following what's already there and I'm just dropping it in.
So you can see that it kind of ran out here over the edge a little bit. So I can try to clean that up, but it might, you never know, it might make more of a mess than you want. I really like that. And because I can, I'm going to take a little bit of the gold mica and just drop it into the mimosa to give him a little sparkle, just because I want to. <laughs> Clean my brush and dry it off, and then just lightly go along my edges to make sure they're nice. There. And then I'll do the same down here for the rest of his body, leaving a little bit of space anywhere where there might be some wet paint. And I'm going to keep this down here, the granat, because that's what I see. When you only use three colors, it's easy to remember what you've painted. And I'm just going to drop it in. Rinse my brush, dry it off. And then just use the tip of my brush to sort of move that paint to the edges. There. So now that I've done the bird, I'm really thinking the tail needs to be darker. So I'll put a little water glaze down, just a tiny bit of water to help. And then I'll take the orange, because that's what I use, the orange sanguine, and just drop it in, and then move up to the edges, not touching anything that's wet, but just going close to it. I like that. And then bringing that paint all the way down. There. Perfect. So the only thing that stands out to me now is his beak. And I think I'm going to put a little bit more but you know what? I'm going to use the Copper Rose, and I'm going to make a nice little dilution on my palette, and I'm going to give his beak a little shimmer because, because I can. And that's the fun part. Whatever speaks to you about what you're doing, that's what you do. When that dries, that'll be nice and shimmery. So I think his eye needs a little bit of sparkle too. And so I'm gonna take a little bit of the gold mica. And he's gonna be a gold-eyed bird. So on his iris, I'm just gonna put a little bit of gold there. Okay, so that's all I really need to do with paint. And at this point, I would let it dry and either leave it as it is, or I might go back with a gel pen and put some lines for feathers. Um, I don't know though, I think I just kind of like it the way it is, so I'm gonna leave it. So that's it, um, that's really the practice. And however you choose um, to see what's in the paint, that's what you surround with pencil, and then you, you follow the steps that I've showed you. And they're gonna turn out different every time. Never in my wildest imagination would I have dreamed up this bird, okay? But I saw it in the paint, and I just surrounded it and enhanced it with more paint, the same colors that I used. I did add a little bit of sparkle because it's fun, um, and you can go back and you can use your gel pens or watercolor pencils or anything you want. You can take it as far as you wanna take it. So I hope this is fun to you, and I hope you will try it, and I really would love to see what you come up with. Um, and remember that you, you need to do it a few times to get the hang of it. 
um, but I think you'll be surprised at what an enjoyable experience it is. And I am always forever surprised whenever I do this practice. So that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. And I will see you next time with another Artist for Everyone video. Thank you.